Okay, thank you. So good to have you here today. And if you're visiting, I'm Pastor Thor Sorensen. So glad you could be our guest. Love to get to know you better. And uh, just a couple things I want to share. I don't know if Dan Summers is here, uh, but our condolences to Dan and his family on the passing of his mother uh, just this uh, past week. Uh, Dan's mother loved the Lord so much. When Dan uh, talked to me, he said, my last words to my mother were, I love you, Mom. And she said, I love Jesus so much. She said, I'm not going to give any of my inheritance to my kids. It's all going to Jesus. <laughs> she loved the Lord so much. So just pray for that beautiful family. Uh, that God will comfort them. <clears throat> um, any military here today, anyone in the armed services, just stand up. If you're in the armed services, I want you to stand up. I know there's some here. Just, yeah, all of you stand up if you're in the armed services. Uh, God bless you, or if you're a veteran. Uh, I know we have others in the other service. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have the privilege of Chris Jolin and his wife Jenny are going to be sharing... And I had the privilege to hear him this past year, and he touched our hearts as he talked about his ministry uh, in, I believe it's South Korea. <clears throat> You'd like to get up north, I suppose, there, but uh, right now it's South Korea. And so God is going to bless you as he shares uh, how God has called him to the mission field and his family. Let's give him a warm welcome as he comes today. God bless you. All right, let me turn that thing on there, pick this up. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate it. It's always good to be invited back, at least that means you didn't see, say anything funny the last time you were here. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I am a graduate of Proctor High School. I know I'm in Hermantown, so don't hold that against me. My wife is a Denfeld hunter, so you can hold that against her. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's awesome. Yeah, uh, 20 years ago, uh, 1995, I graduated, uh, and John, hey, I graduated with John, so that was awesome. And, uh, and so, yeah, so I, our mascot was the rails, um, I think, right? It was like a train or some rails, or I never quite knew. At least Hermantown has a hawk. They can have a great, great thing there. Um, so thank you for having me today. I was told I have an hour and a half. Is that, is that right? Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, yeah, so if you hear snoring, just come up and wake me up. Uh, I, I promise I'll, I'll wake up and we'll be good. Um, after high school, 20 years ago, I entered the Army. I felt a clear call from God. It was one of my biggest first acts of faith. I had come to, come to Christ at the age of 14, and it took a lot of growing up in high school for me. Uh, a lot of things to work through. Um, I definitely had some personal conflicts and things, but the Lord really touched my heart. So 20 years ago, I entered the Army. I have a couple of pictures of this. Look at how young I am up there. Yeah, just 18-year-old uh, there and loving life, big ears and everything. That was actually 60 pounds ago, if you believe it or not. Um, I, when I entered basic training, I was about 158 pounds. By the end of that four months, I was 196 pounds and I had grew an inch. So... Um, those ladies knew how to cook in Alabama, and I loved it. Um, so here I am. As a young private, uh, I, went to, uh, I went to Alabama to do my basic training. I was stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I was a prison guard. They had a, a regional correctional facility there, and I was an 18-year-old prison guard guarding uh, military inmates, which was an interesting thing. One day, as I'm frisking an inmate coming out of the dining facility, we had to do this uh, morning, afternoon, and night uh, because we had to make sure they didn't bring utensils back into the wing with them. I was frisking an inmate, um, a guy named Rich, who was an awesome, awesome Christian man, um, had turned his life around while he was in, in jail there. He turned around and said, Private Jolin, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah. How'd you know? And he said, I could just tell. And I was like, well, that's awesome. Um, and he says, have you heard of uh, Jim Smith? He's an MP, and he comes in here every day or every week and does a navigator Bible study 
uh, for us inmates, and uh, you should know him because you're kind of like an MP too. I said, no, I've never heard of him, but I'd love to come in later today and come to meet him. And so later that day, I went into the chapel as they were uh, doing Bible study. I barged right in, not knowing they were in the middle of everything, and I said, hey, Jim, I'm Chris. And everybody's looking at me awkwardly. Little did I know that that conversation with Rich would change my life. See, Jim was in a ministry started by a couple who had followed God's call to Fort Knox to minister to soldiers. They felt his clear call to be missionaries to the military. And because of their faithfulness and obedience, hundreds of men and women have come to know Jesus and have left that place equipped and established and encouraged to share their faith with others. Because of them and the men they discipled and loved, I was discipled and brought into their ministry, and my life was transformed. So here I am today to speak to you a little bit about missions. I want to speak to you today about the importance of a calling to missions, the importance of missions, the importance of supporting missions and missionaries, and my family's specific call to missions. Dawson Trotman was a great man of God. Some of you may have never heard of him. I have because I'm just one person among tens of thousands, literally, who have heard the gospel because of his call to missions. He was the founder of the Navigators. And that couple who founded that Fort Knox ministry back in the 60s, Jim and Rachel Webster, were influenced by his, his message. In turn, Jim Webster discipled men who discipled men, who discipled Jim Smith, who discipled me. And I listened to a message of Trotman's years ago, it was probably like 20 years ago, and he gave this message in the 1950s, and it was titled, The Need of the Hour. So as I was thinking about this message today, I thought, what is the need of the hour? And God just kept laying that on my heart. So I wanted to share with you today uh, the need of the hour. And so that's the name of my message. So what is the need of the hour? Trotman knew. He knew because Jesus knew and told his disciples, who told their followers, who told others, who told others, who entrusted that to us today. I believe missions is the need of the hour. Why is missions an important calling? Because it transforms lives. How is the world going to hear the good news of the gospel if not by us? each one of us. What was Trotman's thoughts on the need of the hour? This is what he said. He believed the need of the hour is an army of soldiers dedicated to Jesus Christ who believe not only that he is God, but that he can fulfill every promise he has ever made and that there isn't anything too hard for him. Sounds like missions to me. Why do we need an army of Christians? You and I both know why. It's because we live in a broken world, scarred by sin. None of us are immune to its effects. Some of us carry it around with us even now. And our own personal sin, the sin of others, sometimes that's the, sometimes the hardest to take, right? So we carry this around. Many of us have these scars. We see the brokenness in our homes, in our streets, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our nation, and throughout the world. Jenny and I see it in the military. I saw it, certainly. So why is missions an important calling? Because the need of the hour is for pe people of faith to believe and obey Christ's commission to seek and save those who are lost in this broken world. What are the last things Jesus said to his disciples before his ascension? Remember Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He also said this, we know, uh, in Acts 1.8, before he went up. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in, all, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus left his disciples with a job to do. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, 
So what does this therefore mean? It means I have the power, Jesus says, I have the power to give you the order and I have the power to back you to the hilt to carry that out. Jesus has all the power in heaven and not just heaven but on earth. He has all the power, not just part of the power, not just some of the power, all power, which means power over anyone and anything. And as the kids say these days, what? Right? Did I do that right, kids? Okay. Earlier, Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 21, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he or she do. Do you believe that statement is true? I certainly do. Can we say that for a moment it should make us stop and wonder just a little bit? Could it possibly be true that the Son of God would say to a human being, to you and to me, the things that I do, you can and will do, and greater things than these you shall do. Whoa, mind blow. I believe with all my heart the reason so many Christians don't accomplish more in their lives is they don't believe Jesus meant what he said. They have never come to a place where they believe that the all-powerful one who have commissioned them could enable them to do these greater works. The need of the hour is for us to believe, to trust God that he will do that in us and that he can do that in our churches and in others. The last thing Jesus said was, all power is given to me. This is the last thing he said. I'm giving you some orders now, disciples. Go and teach all nations and see that every created being hears the word. Go and love them. Go and serve them. Go and preach them. Preach them. Teach them about how I've transformed your lives. The need of the hour is for all of us to have the mindset of missions. This was Christ's call in our hearts the moment we surrendered to him. The moment we declared to him to be our savior, we immediately became a missionary to others. Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, 16, and again, I might add, to each one of us, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, fruit that should abide. All of us are called to missions. I'm going to share with you something that maybe you didn't know or maybe you haven't heard this before. Each one of you who have called Christ Lord You who have turned from sin and confessed it to God. You who have declared before God and others that he is yours and you are his. You are missionaries, just like me. What do missionaries do? We go. Jesus said we need to go. And the word Jesus used here is a Greek word that communicates the idea as you are going. So as we are going about our daily lives, as we're going to work, and as we're going to school, as we're going to the store, or going to the cabin, or whatever it is, we have a mission. Are you a teacher? What's your mission? Are you a nurse? What's your mission? Are you in IT? Do you work with computers all day? What is your mission? Do you drive a truck? Are you an auto mechanic? Are you a stay-at-home mom? What is your mission? Are you retired? What is your mission? Are you in college? Are you in high school? What is your mission? Our mission and your mission, the need of the hour, is that we tell others about what God has done to transform us. See, sometimes we become salt warehouses, don't we? Our churches sometimes become places where we enjoy community amongst ourselves, but we never look outward. And honestly, I'm so happy to hear that, you're, that your church looks outward. Uh, you support many missionaries, and that is an awesome thing. That tells me you have a mindset of missions. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. We were not meant to keep the good news of Jesus to ourselves. Like salt, we are to flavor the world around us our homes, our neighborhoods, our schools, and our workplaces. 
The prophet Jeremiah said this in chapter 20 and verse 9, But if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak in his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in, and I can't do it. In his name and with his power, we can go out with faith and confidence that he is with us. We can go out and not only preach and teach and baptize, but act. The gospel is word and deed, and Paul says in Colossians, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. So why is missions an important calling? Because Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, has called each of us to be missionaries to a lost and broken world. He has called all believers to be a light in the darkness, to be the salt of the earth. Who else if not you and me? Where you work, where you live, where you go to school, the people you interact with are different from the people sitting next to you. I can't reach them, and the people I'm going to reach, you can't speak with them one-on-one, but I can. And that's the puzzle piece Mary Kay was talking about. I love that. That was great. In 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 light of the importance of missions, it should come as no surprise then that it's important for us to support missions and missionaries. If we, have heard, if we have the heart of Christ to see people loved and cared for, to see them turn from their life of sin and, redemp- and to find redemption, to find peace and joy in this life so they can certainly find it in the next, why wouldn't we give of our time or our talent or our treasure to see sure that this mission, that this vision of Christ is carried out? The church, this church, exists to carry out the mission of Christ. Each one of us has been ministered to by faithful men and women. I'm sure you get that every weekend you come here. Every night there's a church service here. Faithful men men and women, they give of their time and talent and treasure because you're important to them. God's mission is important to them, his vision. Hermantown is important to them. Dare I say Proctor is important to them, I guess. Um, The Duluth area is important, right? The church couldn't carry out the good work it does without your time and your talent and definitely without your financial support. You give generously, and some of you, out of your abundance, and praise God for that. And some of you give out of what little you have. And you know what? Praise God for that. Whatever you give, you do it because you believe in the mission. God has worked in you to give generously to his cause. Individual missionaries and missions organizations are in need of the same thing. God has called us to specific places, to specific ministries, to specific causes. Maybe it's to indigenous peoples in Africa or South America. Maybe it's to the inner city. Maybe it's working with the poor or the widows or the orphans. Uh, We know plenty of people whose passion is for Haiti, and they go on a missions trip every year to support that. My auto mechanic has such a passion for Haiti that he has used some of his business funds and gone in with his uncle to purchase a house in Haiti just so that they can have a base of operations to support missions in that country. That's awesome. Maybe it's combating sex slavery in Southeast Asia. We know somebody who is deeply, that's her passion, and she does it well, and and she has a great cause. In our case... It's U.S. soldiers stationed overseas, and I'm going to show you a quick clip about what we do. So please, look. accomplish my mission as a chaplain without the help of Gaitis. It's that simple. We're just one of the many faces that are here that are testimonies. Love military. 
military people and their families. That's what we're about. That's the bottom line. We have a great privilege that a lot of the world ever experiences. We become community. A sanctuary for a lot of these families. We can tell them about Jesus. You don't have to do stuff. You just love. God uses the things that we're passionate about and that we love. We just get to pick the fruit. To just come alongside people and, and help them see that there is more to this life. They're vulnerable. They're at a change point in life. This is my people group. Cadence is a powerful force, and the body of Christ is better for it. The mission statement of Cadence is sharing the gospel in our lives with the military community. Whether it's a youth group or a coffee house or uh, a foreign military, we're sharing the gospel in our lives. That's really the foundation to raise our kids with them, to walk in our marriage with them, to disciple them, to have Bible studies with them. And each time we share our life with them, we share the gospel as well. I think there's respect for what military people stand for, the honor, the duty, the service, and the sacrifice. But I think people probably sometimes wonder, do they really need a, a mission agency to dedicate its entire focus and mission on them. And we know the resounding answer is yes. Whether they've got uh, general you know, stars on their shoulder, whether they're a private first class, God looks at the heart. I remember a time when I got to Yokosuka, Japan, and was in our hospitality house there. And I remember talking to this one kid. I said, Matt, tell me your story. Here's a kid, he's 18 years old. He was an alcoholic by the time he was 16. Beneath that nice uniform was a kid who was so far from God and so lost. They find themselves empty and lost and away from home. They're gonna be deciding what their future is really all about. The things that are really scary that are out there, these young, vulnerable people are experiencing. Drug abuse is up, suicide is up, divorce, I mean, just all these things are, are just, uh, ripping through our military communities. It's a, a wonderful opportunity to see them come out of the most vulnerable time in their life and into this place that's truly safe so that they can hear the gospel. Beneath the uniform, there's a person that God loves and that we are delighted to bring Jesus to. Cadence has a rich history. Our founder went through the Bataan Death March and he promised the Lord that if he saved him through that episode, that he and his wife would minister to military. After Jesse and Nettie had uh, led a bunch of us servicemen to the Lord, it was a thrilling thing to watch the first servicemen's home being kind of brought together and gelled together without realizing that was going to become a pattern for the next 50 to 60 years. For all of our years, we have sought to love sincerely. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, love must be sincere. It's serving meals, it's leading Bible studies, it's uh, helping with the worship service at chapel. It's activities, rock climbing, rappelling, taking marine scuba diving in Okinawa. It's taking kids on, uh, on youth retreats over the weekend. It's having lunch with them at school during the week. There's something about genuine, authentic people that Christ powerfully uses in others' lives. Sincere love is incredibly powerful. Love it. Man, every time I see it, I've seen it a million times, and I love it. Um, that's our passion, man. That's who we're called to go. And while it's true all of us here are called to go, it's also true that only some of us are called to go a little further, right? Remember, remember that Acts uh, 1a passage, uh, all Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, you know, Holy Spirit will come, come upon you, you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Some of those disciples were called to witness in Jerusalem, and at some point Jesus was going to call some to go a little further in Judea, the larger nation. 
and he was going to call some to go to Samaria, you know, those, those hated Samarians, and then to the end of the earth, right? Not all of us are called to do that, and I definitely, um, I definitely echo that. Two years ago, I wouldn't have felt the same thing, you know, I, I wouldn't have believed that God was going to call me to this, right? I know some of us here are saying, amen, <laughs> God's not calling me to go to Korea or Japan or Africa, and that's, that's okay, um, as long as we know what our mission is, right? Two years ago, I would have thought the same thing. I'm, I'm actually the guy who had this conversation with God. Lord, I know I will never be a missionary. Uh, I know that's for other people, not for me. I know that you have other things for me and not that. I love America. I'll stay here. I love my job and my comfortable home. That's for other people to do. So I know you'll never do that to me. Um, and so I'm not sure because God and I had this great conversation and we had this settled. I'm not sure how our family got on his list to go a little further. But uh, sometimes that happens. Never say never. We believe, though, and, and I would say any missionary you ever meet, right? With all our hearts that God has called us. And Jenny and I, with all our hearts, believe that we've been chosen and equipped for this task. We are ready to go knowing God will provide. You know, we believe that when Jesus said to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. At some point, every one of us has to internalize that, right? Whatever our mission is, whether it's in this town, whether it's at your job, your workplace, your school, whether it's going overseas like we're going to be doing, at some point you have to internalize that message, right? God chose me and appointed me to go and bear fruit. And that fruit is witnessing and sharing the gospel in the lives of other people. God supports missionaries through people like you. God supports the church. God supports missions activities through you. You are faithful men and women whose mission is in their hometown, whose mission, whose mission probably isn't your job, though it might be, but who feel called to give generously to missionaries called to share Christ and to go a little further away. This isn't a new thing. Jesus also relied on the generosity of his followers. And in just one example, consider Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, and it reads this. Uh, soon afterward, he, meaning Jesus, went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the new good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. And here's the kicker. And many others who provided for them out of their means. Just as Jesus and his followers needed the support of those who believed in his mission on earth then, he still needs believers to surround faithful ministers of God's kingdom today. See, the need of the hour is for us not only to embrace missions, not only to internalize that, hey, we're missionaries, and some are called to go a little further, and we're called to send them a little further. But he still needs believers. He still needs people to go out and do these things. I'm going to take a moment to invite my wife up uh, and embarrass her in front of you all. She, uh, she generally doesn't speak, so... If she sounds wooden, then that's okay, right? Okay, now I'm making fun of her in front of everybody. Um, at this point, we would like to take a, a little bit of time to share about what God has called our family to. I think we have a couple of pictures of our beautiful family. This was taken recently in California. My little sister lives out there now. She's an Air Force vet. Her husband is. This was on the coast uh, near the Redwoods. Uh, this was a great picture. We love it. Uh, we have a oldest, our oldest daughter's 12, and we have three Three boys, three rambunctious little boys. And uh, yeah, here's that picture. So I don't know if we have another one. Is there another one in there? Oh, yeah, there we go. That is in a redwood. And that's a small redwood, by the way. So that wasn't even a big one. Uh, so there we are, uh, enjoying the nice 50-degree weather out, out there. So our family has been called to do this crazy task, right? The vision of Cadence International and we are Cadence missionaries, the vision of Cadence International is to exalt Christ in the nations through the lives of transformed military people. And I shared a little bit with you about my story. 
about the couple who were with the navigators, not with Cadence, but with the couple who invited me into their home, into their ministry. And at that time, I was 18. I was at Fort Knox, and I remember the first night being in my barracks room. I was all alone. I remember I had some milk, some PB&J, and a little tape player. And that's all I had to my name along with my military clothes. And I just remember sitting on my, my barracks bed thinking, Lord, why in the world did you call me here? I was lonely. I was a little depressed. I could hear loud noises out there, and I didn't know anybody. And it was a super scary time for me. And this couple, through Rich, through Jim, invited me into their home and ministered to me. They took care of me. They gave me meals that we did fun stuff together. We did Bible studies. I heard messages. They taught me how to pray, how to read my Bible. They taught me what a quiet time was. You know, these are basic things that I didn't even know, and I'd been a Christian for a number of years at that point. This is exactly what Cadence International does. It's funny, until we became Cadence missionaries, I didn't know that my good buddy Jim Smith, who I still support and who's now serving with the Navigators in China, he can't say where, because they're working with a Muslim people group. Little did I know, before Jim came to Fort Knox, he was in a Cadence Hospitality House. And those people took such good care of him at that time in their life. It kind of set him on fire for the gospel. So when he came to Fort Knox, I was one of the first guys he ever discipled. And man, am I thank, do I thank God for Cadence International. And we're really excited to do this mission as a whole family. You saw our four kids up there. And just a quick little story, just the other day, Chris was going out and he was talking with some business leaders in our community. And the kids were asking, oh, where's daddy this morning? And I said, mm. oh, he just went off to go talk about our mission. And one of the kids from the back piped up and said, well, you mean our mission, right? And I'm like, you're right. Yes, this is <laughs> our mission. Our whole family is yeah. going to be missionaries. Yeah. They will be just as much a part of going out and loving on our soldiers as we will be. Yeah, and as you heard in, in that video, I mean, these are people who know duty, who know honor, who know sacrifice, but are just like you and me. Under that uniform is somebody who's possibly hurting, somebody who's far away from their own family. Um, I heard it put this way by a chaplain who was one of my supervisors. I was a chaplain candidate. I was planning on going active duty when I was in seminary, and that didn't happen, praise God, because I'm doing something I'm really passionate about now. Uh, but he said, you know, when a soldier gets deployed or a family gets deployed, it's, it's like they're both on an escalator in life. That soldier or that family now gets off. Well, everybody back home keeps going. And then that soldier comes back and they have all these different, everything's changed in life. And that happens with our soldiers. And during this time that they're away, they're in a wartime posture. They're Army's even more hardcore on them when they're, when they're stationed overseas. Their family is far from home. They don't have all the things that you and I have. They might have a very limited supply of things on their base. Uh, young soldiers, to be honest, you know, they have a lot more than some of you vets ever did. I, even, even I did, and I served only about 17 years ago. And, and yet, there's only so many times you can go to the Popeyes on base, or you can go to the dining center before you start thinking, okay, what's off base? And in any country, uh, they're going to have, any country where we have a foreign military base, as soon as you step outside that base and look across the street, you're going to have every think, single vice you can think of for a young 18 to 24-year-old soldier who's all the money in the world, more money than he's ever had in his life, and he can spend that on in anything and anyone he wants, and I mean that. And so who is there to show them a different way? Chaplains can only do so much. You saw the chaplain in, in the video. What Cadence does is we walk alongside those people and minister to their soldiers. We counsel couples who are going through a tough time in marriage. Constant separation for years or months at a time can really have an impact. Jenny can share with you a story when we visited Yokosuka, Japan, about a young, young mom. Yeah, one other quick story. There was a woman that we met while we were there, and she was due in about two weeks yeah. with their second child, and they had a little 18-month-old also. And so I know many of you have children, and you can imagine what it's like as you're anticipating a second child, and you have a toddler at home already, and all of the needs that you have physically, emotionally, um, around the house with the little one. 
And so she was getting ready to deliver her baby, and then her husband was just deployed for who knows how long um, from Japan on the USS George Washington aircraft carrier. And so there she is, halfway across the world, all by herself, no family, no friends, no support network, and she had to deliver this baby. And I might add, her husband would not allow her to go and visit the Cadence Hospitality House when he was around. He wasn't a Christian, he wasn't a believer, and he thought, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm in charge, I can handle this, and I can take care of all your needs. And so the way that Cadence could minister to her was to come around her. They were at the hospital with her. They were watching her baby for her, bringing her meals, helping around the house. And that was just a tangible way that they could be the hands and feet of Christ for this woman. And we don't know what will happen many years down the road and how she'll reach out and touch somebody else. But that's just one physical way that we can help show love to these soldiers. Yeah, I think we have a, another couple of pictures here, um, and I can talk through them as we go. This is Walter. He is a young Air Force officer. We met him at the Osan Air Base in Korea. And second lieutenant, recent graduate from high school, this is another young couple, and I'll have you just stop right there, Sarah, if you're listening. Um, just have you pause it right there. This is another young couple. They're also stationed at Osan. Um, Josh here, he is, a, is another officer stationed in the Air Force. His wife and his daughter were back in the States. Like he was, he was what we call an unaccompanied um, deployment. And so his, his wife, his family had to stay behind. They just so happened to kind of skirt the rules a little bit and stay with the hospitality house couple so that they could visit him. Um, but imagine what it's like for these folks in a wartime posture, they're in Korea. I mean, uh, Walter couldn't even tell me what his job was because it's in intelligence, it's highly secretive, and you know, they're doing, they're listening. Let's just say they're listening to Russians, Chinese, North Koreans, all those kind of fun things. Uh, Josh is a drug counselor, and so not only is their life tough enough, but now they have family back home. They're deployed far away. Who do they interact with? Who do they go to? And yet they were able to be a part of this hospitality ministry. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is, uh, and you can pause it right there, this is one of their, uh, this is the Wednesday night, was it? Wednesday night or Friday night gathering, something like that. Um, this is where generally Cadence will have a Bible study night. They'll have a message night where somebody like me will come up um, as a house director and will give a message, much like a church service. And they'll have music, and this is a small gathering. Go to the next slide, and this will kind of cover the rest of the room. Um, and you can kind of see everybody's kind of stuffed into one place. And if you go to the next slide, you can kind of get an idea and pause it right there. This is that hospitality house. So on that second level, that was that room that you saw. And one of our missions, one of the ways we carry out that vision to exalt Christ in the nations, to serve our military, is to provide them a fantastic meal, a home-cooked meal, an American meal, something that's homemade, not from a restaurant, not from the PX, not from their dining center that's sloppy and you know, whatever it is, but we get to provide that. And so they, they stuff them all in. There's about 50, 50 soldiers and family there. Uh, they have a little kitchen in the corner and everybody chips in and then they set up the tables and when it's time to worship, they kind of take down the tables and everybody gathers around and they do ministry. And so that's part of what we're gonna be doing. We are called specifically to South Korea. Um, I don't know if you wanna talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, she's like, no. Um, we are called specifically to South Korea. Camp Humphreys is one of the places we visited. Currently, there is no hospitality house there. In a minute, I'm going to show a video here, um, and I'll tell Sarah to give that in a second. But Camp Humphreys is a strategic location. Uh, a couple of years ago, Korea and the United States government made a, a, a deal. And the, the Koreans said, hey, we want you to take all a bunch of your little bases that are scattered around our country. We want our land back because it's pretty valuable to us and there's a lot of us here. There are 60 million people in Korea and Korea is, the land, uh, is smaller than the land size of Minnesota and what, we have 5 million? So can you imagine Minneapolis, St. Paul is Seoul and there's most of the population of that 60 million, is there what, 40 plus million? in Minneapolis, St. Paul, or in Duluth area or something like that. It's crazy, it's crazy what the density is. And they said, we want, to, we want that land back because the land is valuable, and we'll give you a huge chunk of land at Camp Humphreys, and we want you to consolidate all those troops there. So as the video will show, right now we're at about 
six to 10,000 soldiers and their families. The U.S. is going to be building that up from 40 to 70,000 in the next two years. So, as you can tell, that's going to be a, a large city-sized population of American soldiers and family. And we don't have a hospitality house there. And the chaplains will be overrun with needs. And so we have been asked, our family has been asked to leave our home and to commit to going there for at least four years. And uh, I think what we'll do right now is, I wanna share this video really quick. It's another five minute clip, I think. And then uh, we'll come back up and talk a little bit more. Yep, thank you. The reason we see Camp Humphreys is such a strategic location to build a new ministry center inside is because Korea is consolidating all of the military bases throughout Korea as far as the army goes and they're bringing all the armies here. It's going to triple the land size and increase the personnel size by sevenfold. So we're going to have up to 70,000 people here and, and uh, right now we're at 10,000. To be the largest military installation outside of the U.S. says a lot right there. Right here, it's going to be the main road to Camp Humphreys. Uh, all around us at the moment, we're surrounded by rice fields. But if you can imagine in the coming years when this is all houses, this is all buildings, all uh, businesses, we want to be set up here with a Christian ministry, a Christian influence in this community by the time all these thousands of soldiers and their families move to Camp Humphreys. The Army's pretty much given us everything we need. Great equipment, great housing, great opportunities all around the world. It's something that Cadence can provide us. This is a place where Christians can fellowship together with great leaders, great mentors who are willing to spend the time. Every aspect of the Cadence ministry is, is, is needed right here at Camp Humphreys. Every aspect of the family is going to be represented here. You know, the married couple, the single parents, the children, uh, the young men and women. I think this is the perfect place and the perfect time for Cadence to do its um, biggest and best work. We just praying for that day. When I was deployed in Iraq, I got lots of care packages from schools and from concerned people and from well-wishing Americans and it was so appreciated. What you can really do for us now is to continue to provide for the eternal gift of salvation for our soldiers in supporting Cadence International and hospitality house here at Camp Humphreys. Hi, I'm Todd Tillipa, and I'm the Vice President for Field Ministries here at Cadence International. I'm so moved and challenged by the desire of folks to have community and to have the kind of fellowship that many of you experience. And so that's what we really want to do at Camp Humphreys is we want to bring that kind of ministry there. You know, over 60 years ago, there were five guys in Yokosuka, Japan, five single sailors who together pooled their money. They each gave $1,000, um, an incredible sacrifice, a lot of money for a single sailor at that time. And they pooled their money and they bought uh, a little place uh, near the Yokosuka Naval Station. And that place over the years became uh, the Cadence Hospitality House uh, what is now called the Lighthouse there at Yokosuka. And um, several years back, the little place that they bought, uh, we were able to sell that uh, for millions of dollars and go and build a beautiful building there at Yokosuka and, and fund all of that because of the sacrifice of those single sailors. And uh, thousands have been uh, ministered to. Um, many have found Christ in that place. And, and those soldiers had no idea what uh, their, their little gift, if you will, their sacrifice um, did over the years. Now, looking back, we have an idea. And so now we're looking at Camp Humphreys and we're looking for people that will sacrifice with us uh, to make the same thing happen. We would love to see uh, a foothold there for the gospel and to see people come together and, uh, and, and raise the money it takes. It's gonna take a lot more than $5,000. We, we figure it will take about $80,000 to establish a ministry there. We already have the people, we have a couple that uh, has, uh, are appointed and are ready to go. 
but we need the finances. And so we are looking for uh, participation from our current donors, uh, from our, even our own missionaries and, and our support and leadership staff here at Cadence have gotten involved and now we're asking you, uh, would you get involved? And together we really believe that we can raise the money uh, to make this happen. Now we're asking you to give, we're not asking you to take away from the money that you're giving to your chapel or to your churches or to your hospitality house. We're asking you to give above and beyond in sacrificial ways towards this project. You know, it's, it's humbling to think there's going to be that many people, and I'm going to be the house director of that ministry. Whew. Um, sometimes that's the way missions um, goes. I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 3. God says, call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Years ago, when I prayed for direction and purpose, I couldn't have comprehended this. <laughs> or what we're doing now. But that's the way God promised it to be. And that's the way it can be in your life too. This is my mission. This is my family's mission. This is your mission. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Pastor Thor, please. Let's uh, pray.